meditation. Today is 1st March 2021. In next hour, we will hosting two great speakers today who are known internationally for their work on SDG or Sustainable Development Goal, specifically on SDG 6, Water and Sanitation. My name is Ahmad Ismail, your host and moderator for today. I'm a professor at University of Putra, Malaysia. I'm wildlife ecology and ecotoxicology. Currently, I'm the president of Malaysian Nature Society and the council member of the Academy of Science Malaysia. I would like to thank the Department of Agriculture, uh, Department of Architecture, sorry, Faculty of Design and Architecture for organizing the webinar series number two on SDG 6, Water and Sanitation. I welcome everyone who are here today. The webinar series on SDG 6 is co-organized by UNEP from uh, the Global Water Initiative Awareness Program with University Putra Malaysia. The objective are to increase awareness on the importance of ocean quality preservation in promoting sustainable livelihood for coastal communities and to share culture-based technology in the area of sanitation to remote settlements. In each series, we arrange key speakers from among the members of the Global Wastewater Initiative Awareness Program and pilot project partners from Malaysia. Today is the second of the 11 uh, webinar series planned for year 2021 under the SDG 6 title. The webinar series recognizes the partners and supporter from SDG 6, a supporter for SDG 6, among them are Malaysia, uh, University of Malaysia Sabah and Malaysia Industry Government Group for High Technology Mind. The webinar series is part of the 50th uh, celebration of the establishment of University Putra Malaysia. Ladies and gentlemen, please be informed that all session is recorded for the case analysis by the United uh, Nations Environment Program. Now I would like to uh, and, uh, invite uh, the first speaker. Before that, I would like to inform also the session is also streamlined at Facebook. Our first speaker is Dr. Peter Swazinski, Section Head of International IAEA Radio Ecology Laboratory in Monaco. He was nominated by United Nations Environment Program who to speak about microplastic pollution in oceans. Allow me to introduce Dr. Swazinski. Dr. Peter Swazinski has been working on the International Atomic Agency Energy Agency, IAEA, Marine Plastic Project for several years. It is one component of how the agency and is addressing ocean change, uh, which include project in pollution, ocean acid acidification, warming, and deoxygenation. As the only marine laboratory in the United Nations system, Dr. Swazinski works closely with IAEA sister United Nations agencies to address the environmental, marine, and climate change impact. Before we listen to microplastic threat to our ocean, I would like to invite the audience to write in the chat box any question you may have for our both speakers. We will gather all the questions and at the end of the talk for the question uh, for the question and answer session. So now Professor, uh, Dr. Peter Swazinski, the floor is yours. Great. Um, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, welcome, everybody. I wanted to thank you very much, first of all, for taking the time today um, out of your busy schedules for this webinar series. And I'm very happy to, to present some of our work on marine plastic pollution. If it's okay with you, I'm going to um, share my screen. Yeah. Okay. Can you guys see that? That. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. 
All right. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, so in my 20 minutes or so, I'm going to introduce you to um, the topic of marine plastic pollution in the oceans. And I thought I would start out with this opening slide, the photograph. And this is what gets retained on a, on a particle filter if you pass lots of seawater through it. And I, I wanted to start with this because one of the striking things is how different the different types of plastics are that get retained. If you see, there's a no two particles that look alike or that are shaped alike. There's everything from fibers to, to round spheres, to different sized particles, to different colors, to different degrees of weathering. And I say this in the opening because just to highlight the fact that it's difficult, not only from an analytical point of view, to come up with a methodology that will consistently um, char characterize this plastic, but it's also important from an impact point of view. You can imagine that the impact of these plastic fragments and particles are going to have different impacts depending on, on their inherent nature and, and composition. And these are the two things that I kind of um, I'm going to go over in my presentation today. Peter, can you make the slide bigger, the full screen? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Thank you. Now, does it look okay? How's that? Okay, great. Yes, it's okay. It's okay, Peter. All right. Okay. So the way I have my presentation structured is I'm going to give you a, a brief introduction about the topic of marine pollution, talk a little bit about the plastic cycle. So the upstream downstream side of marine plastic pollution, talk about some potential impacts, especially to humans, and then end my presentation with some kind of next steps, future directions on, on where we might want to go to try and make this plastic pollution problem better from, from many different perspectives. And I thought this is a good opening photograph because it shows this nice juxtaposition between fishers heading out to sea to, to collect their, um, their, their seafood, but they're starting from a beach that is vastly contaminated, and a lot of the contamination is actually um, marine plastics. So you might wonder, what is the IEA that is known for safeguarding and nuclear security doing in the oceans and also doing on plastics? And, and um, this is the building where we are housed in Monaco. We've been in Monaco now for 60 years. In fact, we're going to be celebrating our 60th anniversary later on this year in September. Um, and over these 60 years, we have been really focused on marine radioactivity and then also um, providing support to member states to address marine contamination issues, marine um, general um, resource issues in the oceans. As was mentioned earlier, we're the only marine lab in the UN system, and so we have a, a, a we feel we have a really important role to play to helping our member states um, develop robust um, strategies to address the the most pressing marine challenges. I also would like to mention in this slide, we have a very strong relationship with the government of Monaco and our, our Prince Albert is probably one of the best advocates for um, oceans that we have today. And he really works tirelessly to promote sustainable use of our ocean resources. So we have a really great relationship. We, um, we bring uncontaminated deep Mediterranean waters into our laboratories. Um, in this building that you see here, and from that, um, we can recreate almost any kind of ecosystem um, and look at the marine stressors, and I'll get into this in just a little bit. So, you guys are particularly interested in SGD6, clean water and sanitation. The work that we do in Monaco fits maybe, maybe most directly under the umbrella of SGD14, life underwater, but it certainly, certainly touches on many other of the SGDs including, for example, SGD-13, climate action, SGD-15, life on land, um, and many others. I wanted to also highlight um, that our strategy here in Monaco has recently really focused around the SGDs and around the ocean decade, and almost everything that we do in Monaco now fits underneath ocean and climate change impacts, and our strategy um, 
um, front cover to this report is shown on the right hand side of your slides. So zooming in a little bit closer now to the radio ecology labs. <clears throat> In, we have three labs in Monaco. I'm, I'm the head of a, the radio ecology labs. And in radio ecology, we work with live organisms and everything from zooplankton and phytoplankton up to small sharks. And we look at all kinds of marine stressors and oftentimes in parallel. So, for example, um, we work on hypoxia or anoxia, so deoxygenation. We work on ocean acidification. We work on harmful algal blooms on the demesylation, mesylation of mercury cycling within marine organisms. And we work on different aspects of marine carbon, including blue carbon or, or the, the ability of coastal um, wetland systems and mangrove systems to, to, to sequester carbon. And all of these things we do um, with an eye to nuclear and derived technologies. And in particular in radioecology, we apply we develop and apply radio tracers. And I have just a smattering of them shown on here on the screen. So there's gamma emitters, beta emitters, and alpha emitters. And we work <clears throat> with, with a whole, um, what, we, what we affectionately call a soup of these radio tracers. And th the most important feature of these things is because we can measure things at atoms per liters, we can really look at environmental levels of contamination. So at coming back to marine plastics, we can look at very, very um, small concentrations of marine plastics and their potential impact to living organisms. So the next few slides just deal with some basic definitions. The, if we start with just a size definition from the photograph from Indonesia um, that showed these large plastics on the beach that those are ma macroplastics so they're greater than five centimeters and you know th these are what you hear off oftentimes either um, ensnaring a turtle or a bird or or even whales um, there's also mesoplastics which are five millimeter to five centimeter this is a term derived from our biological oceanographers there's a microplastic which are most commonly um, studied and talked about and this goes from 0.1 millimeter to five millimeter, and then there's nanoplastics, which are anything less than 0.1 millimeter. So in the opening photograph I showed, I tried to illustrate some of the complexity of microplastic characterization. In this um, paper, they do this in, in also kind of in a, in a systematic way, where on the starting on the left, you have the different types of polymers, and I'm not going to go into each one of these, but they range from polypropylene to low density polyethylene to high density polyethylene to PVC, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's additives that we add to bring out a particular nuance or a character of this polymer that we want. So, for example, stabilizers or flame retardants or plasticizers are used. Product types. Um, you can imagine just about anything that we that, that's in our daily lives could fall under this including the monitors and our mouths that we use every day. Size, I've already talked about. The morphology I've touched on, and this is everything from fibers to fiber bundles to fragments to spheres to pellets to films and foams. Colors can, can really encompass the whole spectrum. And then this last category is the co-contaminants, and this winds up being rather important. Um, because these plastics have a biofilm, these plastic particles have a biofilm around them, they have um, um, a very strong propensity to scavenge particle reactive things from the water column. And this can be heavy metals, but it can also be a, a, a cocktail of organic contaminants such as the PAHs, PCBs, or potentially DDT and other things. And, and as you look at this whole smattering of different ways of characterizing marine plastics know too um, that all of this is changing constantly because there's there in the ocean under the corrosive forces of seawater and wave action and light action um, these plastic particles are degrading continuously and, and and microbes obviously also have a very important role in this degradation and 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 transformation of micro of microplastic particles. So you can see easily that it gets quite complicated if you want to um, tease out a particular chemical um, method to look at, for example, one type of polymer, um, one size, one product type, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot that I've 
kind of mentioned, there's a lot that we don't know about plastics. So in this slide, I'm going to mention the, the some of the things that we do actually know. Um, all of you have seen papers or newspaper articles where we, we know that microplastic particles are really everywhere. We have observed them on on large river deltas. We have observed them on the top of the Himalayas. We've observed them in the our poles in the Antarctica and the Arctic. Um, and even in the deepest ocean trench, in the Marianas Trench, um, microplastic particles have been found and are actually already found on and in marine biota there. In terms of vectors, we know that the air, the water, dust, and food are all very important plastic exposure routes or, or vectors. And we have learned that animals, and us humans, are very good at ingesting microplastics. <clears throat> But as much work has has recently happened, let's say over the 10 years or so on marine plastics in all kinds of matrices and all kinds of environments, we really do not fully yet understand how microplastics interact with biological systems, with, with um, for example, the ability to, to, to move across a cell membrane, to move into the blood. Um, and we, yeah, we're still kind of in, in our infancy in learning how these things work. But one of the things we do know is that the toxicity of microplastic is definitely size dependent. And I, I hope to show this later. Um, and it's dependent on what is associated to the microplastics. So these co-contaminants, the dose, the exposure <clears throat> timing and the rates, and also what stage... Um, a target organism is at is it is it a juvenile or is it you know what where is it in its in its in its um, evolution? And this last one I think is 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 also important that any type of epidemiological study fundamentally tracks lacks a true control because everybody is exposed um, knowingly or unknowingly. So this poses obviously some big challenges. Here's a slide from Science Advances just a few years ago, and it, I think it shows nicely kind of the current snapshot of what we are producing and how we're getting rid of it. And this is kind of following an IPCC format where it has these projections. It's 100 years starting in 1950, going to 2050. And if you take a 2015 snapshot, and I've drew a line down here at 2015, 6,300 million tons of plastic have been produced, but less than 10% have been recycled and not much more than 10% have been incinerated and only 78% have made its way um, into the, and, and, and almost 80%, sorry, have made their way into the landfalls, landfills. So if you project forward, you can see that um, where, where these various, um, trajectories lie um, as you go towards 2050. I think we're going to come back to this slide in just a second. I also, with this slide, just wanted to, again, drive home the point that smaller particles are more abundant. And this has implication because fish indiscriminately take up microplastics um, as they mistake them for food. And so the smaller the particles are, the more likely are they're going to be taken into um, into organisms during feeding and then have the propensity to move up the food web. So you might say, okay, well, this is really only something that, that we have known for the last decade or a couple of decades, but I found this paper from Carpenter and Smith that dates back 50 years now, almost 50 years, <clears throat> on plastics in the Sargassum Sea surface. And while they don't differentiate microplastic and nanoplastics or, or, or macroplastics in this paper, they were very um, wise in some of the projections they made. And first of all, they saw that the microplastic particles were everywhere in the Sargassum Sea. <clears throat> and I put a little map of the Sargassum Sea for your, for your information here in the kind of middle of the Atlantic. And with projections in production combined with poor waste disposal practices, this is no doubt going to lead to increases in these particles. And if you go back to the previous slide, this was from 19, <clears throat> this paper um, 
which came out in 1970. You can see here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but this is just in the beginning of the, um, the, the kind of explosion of the production and the problems associated with microplastic pollution. The last point I think is also really important that they, about 50 years ago, already noticed that these plastic particles could be a potential source of organic contaminants such as PCBs that have been recently observed in marine organisms. And this is a point I will touch on a little bit later in my talk. So there's a very strong land-sea connection <clears throat> that dates back five decades. So now moving forward, this, this is um, the this is the cover of a book that recently, that, that is just now coming out. It, it should be out in the next month or so. This is from my colleague and friend, Mike Bank, from Norway's Institute for Marine Research. And it just nicely shows the complexities about this upstream, downstream plastic cycle. And I'm not going to go into all the different compartments, but you can see easily that how complicated it is. And if one of the kind of underlying themes of, of this plastics work is that whatever your background might be in, in, in chemical engineering all the way to marine biology, you can find a niche where you can easily um, work on this plastic pollution problem. And the next few slides kind of just underscore this. I've, I've done some work on submarine canyons and indeed it seems Anywhere you look, you're going to find a propensity for hotspots of microplastic particles. And in this paper that came out in Science Reports in, in just a couple of years ago, they are interested in the mesopelagic waters, so between 200 and 600 meters. And indeed, they showed uh, hotspots of microplastics in these deeper waters. So now moving away from the surface ocean where you would think there would be the most um, particles, you also see it in the deeper water column. <clears throat> For those interested in sediment transport, here's an example that came out in Science in 2020. Um, these, are, these are scientists that are interested in sediment and, and associated contaminants moving downslope in a submarine canyon. And indeed, these complicated turbidity currents and bottom currents also are hotspots for microplastics. So with that kind of brief overview or background on, on marine plastic pollution, I'm going to have the next few slides now deal with kind of this um, potential links to human health. And if you look at the, the graph on the top, I'm showing again a scale of, of one nanometer all the way up to 5,000 micrometers or five millimeters. And it shows a division between nanoplastics and macro, microplastics. The bottom scale shows a potential impact to biological systems. And I'm just going to go through each one of these quickly. If the particles are greater than 150 micrometers, there doesn't seem to be any absorption. Um, if you go less than 150 micrometers, there seems to be absorption onto lymphs. At 100 micrometers, there's absorption into the portal vein. Less than 20 micrometers, there's access into, gourd, into organs. And less than 0.1, you have access to all organs and translocation on the blood brain and the placental barrier. And so right at this comp at this interface between nanoplastics and microplastic sized marine particles is where it gets very complicated um, <clears throat> in terms of toxicity. And you can see there's um, brand new papers coming out on this now just for the first time that are documenting, for example, in, in this case here that <clears throat> There are multiple lines of evidence that microplastic uptake seems to be correlated with bisphenols in three different um, fish species. But the underlying theme here is that any type of accurate risk assessment still remains very challenging because we just don't have enough data yet. So with that background, I'm going to move now to what's going on in Monaco and our own research in Monaco. And in terms of our current research themes on microplastic pollution. <clears throat> we foremost work on absorption, desorption kinetics of radio-labeled chemicals to microplastic surfaces. You got, you got two minutes, uh, Peter. Yeah, I'm just, I'm wrapping up here. The influence of microplastics okay, on bioaccumulation of co-contaminants and the kinetics and distribution of microplastics into biota. 
And while we do a lot of R&D in, <clears throat> in Monaco, we're also in, involved a lot with its transfer of knowledge and information to our member states through the IEA's technical cooperation program. So this, the, the particular nuance of, uh, in R&D on specialized nuclear and derived techniques deal with radio tracers, radio imaging, microscopy, omics and, NM, and NMR to look at stress and these different types of tools that allow us to characterize, such as micro FTIR. I'm going to have one quick snapshot to show um, a radio image. This is in an uptake phase and depuration phase. You can see um, in the uptake phase, the muscle takes up a lot of this particular isotope and then the depuration phase, a lot of this is then ex, ex, um, is, is released. And here's kind of a, uh, an example of some of the work that we're doing. We work on everything from corals, um, the microplastic impact on corals to, to zooplankton. We're interested in antibiotic resistance and microplastic particles, et cetera, et cetera. So, so for next steps, I'm gonna run through this quickly. We really need to work on identifying major plastic emissions hotspots. We need to develop global mass balance models. We need to establish linkages with the Basel Convention and UNEA and utilize um, machine learning where applicable because this is such a complicated analytical problem. Develop best practices guides. This is something we're working on a lot at the IEA and conduct experimental studies to really assess these risks. So, and, and with that, I'm gonna end with this slide here and I wanted to just highlight that the IEA has taken a particular um, focus on a plastics initiative called NewTech, where we are looking both at the upstream side and the downstream side to try and um, to try and use nuclear techniques to address marine plastic pollution. And I will end it with that we have our 60th anniversary in Monaco in September. If anybody happens to be in Monaco around that time, we would love to see you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I hope our uh, COVID-19 will allow us to go there. So thank you, Peter. Very, very interesting, very good presentation. Now I would like to invite for next 20 minutes, uh, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Siti Raina Muhammad Saleh from University of Malaysia Sabah, who will speak about the marine biology wealth at Marine National Parks of Sabah. Uh, Associate Professor Dr. Siti Raina Muhammad Saleh is a director of the Borneo Marine Research Institute. For and formerly, she was a, a dean of School of Sustainable Agriculture in Malaysia Sabah. She received Bachelor of Science and PhD from University of Putra, Malaysia, and then she was a postdoctoral fellow at the Strip Institution of Oceanography, La, uh, La United States of America. Um, where she conducted research on microalgae and seaweed culture. Her research interest is in aquaculture and marine science, where she teach um, about seaweed farming and seed production for fish and sea cucumber. Uh, I would like to remind the audience again, please write a question or opinion in the chat box, and uh, we will discuss later after uh, Professor Raina. Uh, present her uh, presentation. So, as a Professor Dr. Situraina, the floor is yours. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Can you hear me, Prof? Yeah, clear. Yeah. Because we have a very uh, heavy rain here now. Okay, yeah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon from Malaysia. Good morning to our friends in Monaco. Uh, thank you very much, Prof Ahmad, uh, Prof Mart, for the introduction. So before I begin, I would like to extend our appreciation to Professor Rahina from UPM and the team from ACT for inviting UMS in the project together with the UNEP. And thank you very much for bringing this project to Sabah. Uh, on this opportunity, uh, I will be sharing introduction about the marine biodiversity uh, in Sabah. Uh, this brief overview uh, is sharing is, uh, I think, is directly related to the project and uh, significantly important uh, as uh, we know that the project uh, will be conducted in one of the islands in Sabah. So, oh my God, I forgot to share my, my slide. Okay, can you see my slide now? Prof? 
Uh, not yet. Uh, starting, starting. Wait. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now I can see. Uh, right. Okay, go, go ahead. Uh, okay, one minute, bro. Okay. Uh, so, well, uh, for those who may be not very sure where is Sabah is now, uh, so here, Malaysia, uh, located on uh, the Sunda Shelf. Uh, one minute, bro. Can I? I need to. I cannot put the slide uh, in, in a, uh, yeah, I have to put it like this way. Sorry, Prof, because I need my text with me. Uh, so, um, in general, Malaysia is divided in uh, two parts, the east and the west, okay? The west where UPM is located and here in the east, in Borneo, and northern Borneo, is where uh, uh, we are located, okay? So uh, we are strategically located on the northeast of Borneo, and by right from this map, it's clearly uh, it's showing that Malaysia has more marine land, marine area than the land. Therefore, uh, marine environment is very, very important to the country. So, for, for 27 years since the establishment of our, of our university, we have been involved in conducting and leading various research on conservation uh, conservation program at both the state level and regional level. So at this, uh, at the state levels, we are directly, UMS is directly uh, involved in the decision making process of gazetting the marine park. Uh, and co contributing to the protection and conservation of the marine ecosystem. Uh, well, in the international arena, UMS is also known to be active in marine conservation. And we have signed several memorandum of understanding with international universities, uh, uh, universities and institutions. Yes. Uh, for example, uh, the CTI Coral uh, Triangle Initiative Program uh, is a regional uh, regional cooperation program led by six countries: Malaysia, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, uh, Philippines, Solomon Island, and the Timor Leste. So uh, let me back to the. So we 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 are of course uh, aligned, uh, aligning our R and D activities to the Agenda 2030 United Nations with the goal number 40 life below the water so uh, back to this slide uh, Sabah has a total of 1700 kilometer uh, coastline and we are surrounded by three seas the south china sea in the west sulu sea on the northeast and the celebes sea at the southeast so because of that Sabah coastline um, facing the three seas we are blessed with the natural richness and wealth of the marine biodiversity. Of Sabah, of Sabah, um, six marine parks have been gazetted under Sabah Park enactment, 1984. We have a Pulau Tiga Park, Tunku Abdul Rahman Park, Turtle Island Park, Tun Sakaran Marine Park, Pulau Sipadan Park, and lastly, the latest uh, Sugut Island Marine Conservation Area. So from the map, we can see there are three uh, on the on the west side of uh, West Sabah and the three uh, on the east of Sabah. Uh, actually, the different types of marine managed area are due to different objectives. Uh, for, for We have for biodiversity, for fisheries, for turtle and habitat management. All the, all these, um, marine uh, protected area are managed by uh, Sabah authorities uh, including uh, Sabah parks, uh, the wildlife, uh, uh, Sabah wildlife department, department of fisheries, Sabah biodiversity center, uh, WWF Sabah uh, and of course University of Malaysia as I mentioned earlier is indirectly involved in the management team. Uh, so, what are 
what is actually the purposes of uh, establishing the NPS, okay? In general, uh, I have listed six of the objectives of the NPS. First, maintaining the biodiversity by providing uh, places uh, for the endangered and commercial species. Secondly, protecting critical habitats from damage by uh, destructive fishing practices and other human activities, the anthropogenic activities. Thirdly, providing areas where the fish are able to reproduce uh, as a sp spawning ground for them. Okay? And then uh, the fourth is increasing fish catch. Okay? Uh, surround, uh, near, uh, surround the fish uh, grounds. This is for the fishermen, for the economic, social economic. And then uh, building resilience to protect against damage, damaging external impacts such as, such as the climate change. Um, I know uh, we are also facing issues on this plastic, uh, plastic pollution, microplastic pollution, as what Steve is uh, sharing just now. And then lastly, helping to maintain local cultures, uh, economics, and livelihood um, uh, that are related to the marine environment. Okay, I'm sorry, I have to go fast this time. Not so much. Okay, so um, Malaysia is one of the 12 mega biodiversity country in the world. Uh, we put a lot of emphasis on the conservation and sustainable utilization of its uh, rich natural heritage. Uh, so one of the important area of biodiversity conservation is the establishment of this uh, marine protected area. So the crystal clear sapphire water in the beautiful island of Sabah are great for di diving and also snorkeling. So tourists actually visited Sabah are mostly for the beautiful tropical islands, the nature, the wildlife, the wildlife, and of course the rainforest. As uh, we also in Sabah have a beautiful rainforest. Okay, so let's go see what we do we have in Sabah. So um, the coral reef, Sabah has a coral reef that's a home for most of the varied communities of marine uh, life on earth. Samporna district, for example, this is only one district in Sabah uh, alone. Is... Um, excuse me, the yes? letter, um, from my also, I think we have some uh, message that uh, the PowerPoint will be better if it's larger. Also, the sound will be better. If yeah, just just now you cannot do it, Noena. Yeah. Can you make it bigger? Try again. Oh, okay, okay. Let me. Oh, can you just enlarge your PowerPoint uh, the box at the top, right? Okay, need bigger, sikit. Is this bigger? Uh. Yeah, I I closed the thumbnail already. Do okay. Do you mind going for the full screen, the one at the bottom? Oh, okay, right? okay, okay. I got it big already. Okay. 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 This is much better. Okay. Is it is it full, yeah, yeah. full screen or not full screen? No, it's not full screen. It's not uh it's not the uh slideshow. I don't put it on slide. Oh you don't put it. Okay, can yeah. you go to the box on top? Uh to the right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, try that one. Then become smaller. No, 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 it should uh, be larger. Yeah. Okay, then enlarge the picture. Uh, at the bottom. I see some you got lah. At the bottom. At the bottom. At the bottom, where okay, you have hundred okay, percent, okay. enlarge that picture. Uh, no, that's smaller. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Actually, I I can I just maintain like this, Prof. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Why you can't see? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, someone. Okay. I think yeah. this is much bigger, sikit lah. Uh. Okay. So, okay, uh, with the time limited, I will proceed. Uh, sorry for the uh, hiccups. So, this is uh, Sipadan Island. I believe those who, who, who love diving, uh, you know where is Sipadan. Because Sipadan have been, um, uh, have been, what do you call it, voted as one of the top diver sites in the world. So, this is all where we have uh, the beautiful uh, corals, uh, where we have all the uh, the important species of tropical species uh, coral species in the sipadan okay so next is uh, about our seaweed 
I heard just now, uh, Steve, uh, Steve, you you mentioned about sargassum. Uh, we also do have sargassum in in Sabah, but we have more. Uh, like, uh, because of the the long coastline that we have in Sabah alone, we have three hundred and ninety four islands. So this is the best uh, habitat for the growth of the marine macroalgae. So uh, if you look in the uh, in the on the slide, you can see uh, these photos is actually uh, showing uh, the local fishermen uh, uh, harvesting their seaweed. So the seaweed that we have in Sabah actually are, 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 are grown, uh, propagated for commercial. So other than these uh, couple of ficus, we also have the sea grapes and uh, some other important uh, species, uh, uh, Ucuma and uh, Kalorpa that has the economic value. There are in total about 85 species of seaweed recorded in Sabah. Okay, so let's go to the next uh, slide. So this is about the marine mammals. Okay, marine mammals in Sabah are protected under uh, several laws. Uh, the Fish Act 1985, uh, Fisheries Regulation 1999, Wildlife Conservation Enactment. So, um, uh, there are species of marine uh, mammals that uh, we can be, can be found in, in Sabah is like the dugongs. We have whales and dolphins. So if you look at the uh, the right uh, picture, this is actually the recently uh, cited. Uh, we have these uh, killer whales. Uh, surprisingly, killer whales were spotted. Four of them were spotted in Pulau Sipadan. This is another attractive, uh, tourist attractive to come to Sabah. Okay, so about turtles. Turtles in Sabah also is a, is a endangered species protected under the uh, law of uh, Fauna Conservation Ordinance 1984, 83, sorry, uh, the park enactment or also wildlife conservation uh, enactment. So in in UMS, uh, we have experts who, who who did research a lot on the uh, uh, turtles. So in Sabah, we have um, actually three out of four uh, marine turtles uh, found in uh, in Malaysia in a whole. So uh, they are very uh, they are protected under this um, uh, le uh, legislation and uh, some issues uh, arise, especially on. Uh, on eating, eating the uh, turtle's eggs, okay? So the next one is on the marine fish. Large number of marine fish species were found in the M marine protected area and many are commercially uh, important. For example, the snapper and the grouper. Uh, UMS uh, is a uh, well known for their grouper aquaculture research, especially in, in, my, in my institute, we conducted a lot of research on the grouper. The grouper is like our flagship fish and we conducted uh, many study on that. So last I want to share about the uh, marine invertebrates. Uh, that is, this is the most beautiful, I think, creature that we can uh, experience, we can uh, see under the water. They are very colorful and attractive and they make uh, the most uh, of the microscopic life in the ocean. So for the, among the divers, this is uh, not something that is very uh, interesting for them. Okay. So now uh, this part of the, the rich biodiversity in the marine park, they are also uh, being uh, facing threats. Okay. So uh, I have listed six of the threats uh, here. So number one, uh, the issue is on a Ill, uh, destructive fishing methods, illegal fishing uh, using dynamite. This is the problem of the uh, fish bombing. Okay. Secondly, the live feed food fish trade, because we have fresh uh, Sabah is very popular for the fresh seafood. So most of our live free food fish were exported, eh? and it has been uh, over 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 exploited and then sent to. China and Hong Kong. So this is an issue. So the third one is the degradation of the habitat due to development of tourism industry. Fourth is incidental, incidental catch. 
and uh, the government is uh, implementing uh, regulation on the size of the nets uh, allowed to catch to allow that only uh, the biggest size of the fish will be catch and then will be caught and uh, the, well the small juvenile will be allowed to grow until they are the, the, the adult size and then the fifth one is indigenous hunting this is another uh, uh what do you call that a culture ceremonies uh, by the by the people the bajo ethic especially where they they take or they catch dugongs and dolphin a hunt for uh, these mammals and then as a dowry for the wedding okay so we are protecting uh, these dugongs, okay? And then the last one is over exploitation. For example, uh, we have like a sea cucumber. Sea cucumber is very expensive. And now people are all going to the sea and then collecting sea cucumber uh, without uh, considering the size. Huh? Even all, even the smallest size of the uh, sea cucumber being uh, being collected, uh, harvested for uh, for for export so okay um actually we can list as many as issues or possible uh problem but the issue is how can we handle what we should do about the the issues okay so for example uh, the Sabah department of fisheries as one of the managing uh, authority for the marine protected areas plays the big role uh, in um like for example, uh, in uh, regulating fishing activities uh, through licensing, uh, 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 proper uh, uh, proper planning on aquaculture activities, the control of the fishing of endangered species. For example, there are some uh, reef fish that have been identified as, as endangered, like the uh, humphead racers. Eh? You, you cannot simply catch them. or And then also to control the pollution uh, entering into the sea okay so the implementation the implementation of um, resource rehabilitation or resource uh, enhancement uh, restocking of our waters is uh, one of the uh, uh, management strategy uh, on how to uh, restock or to, to bring back all the uh, 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 the resources that we lost okay for example uh, releasing some of the fish or the shrimp or even the sea cucumber uh, bread uh, or produce in the hatchery the juvenile size are ready to release back into the water okay and then what is our role as an education uh, institution uh? so this is uh, the photo showing our uh, our humble uh, hatchery on campus. We conducted research on uh, development of various aspects on aquaculture and also on marine biodiversity. Other than that, we also involve uh, seriously uh, training our students uh, to promote public awareness about marine uh, cons conservation. Okay, with the local community, uh, we, we also uh, transfer our knowledge, eh? especially uh, transferring technology on how to uh, to breed the aquaculture animals. Okay. Got one minute. Okay, okay, okay. I'm going to the end. Okay, uh, so apart, um, Sabah is committed to fulfill the pledge made in order to implement the Convention on Biological Diversity and many management studies uh, strategies can be done. So, for example, like this, uh, the network, strengthening the uh, network between the NGOs, local communities, government agency, we have to work hands in hands in hand uh, uh, seriously to uh, to uh, to solve the issues and. Uh, the Sabah Biodiversity Strategy 2012-22 is to protect the irreplaceable biodiversity present within the spectrum of the ecosystem. So building artificial reef is also, uh, and coral planting is one of the strategy that can be done uh, for uh, conservation and also for the tourist uh, tourism industry in, in, in Sabah. I think uh, that's all that I can share about the uh, overview about uh, marine wealth or marine biodiversity uh, in, in Sabah. Thank so, you. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Raina. Yeah, very you. beautiful picture. I think it's very good. Sabah is a good destination. I saw one good question here. Now is the time um, for question and answer. If uh, we have 10 minutes to do it, uh, I will start with the uh, first question that written here by Osman Sanusi. I think uh, uh, Dr. Peter has to answer this on the, uh, the regulation on the food and food industry uh, because uh, we know that uh, plastic have, uh, uh, is a major concern in food safety and then uh, they have been ingested by human and is there any any attempt to regulate or uh, checkmate these uh, pollutants? Dr. Dr. Peter, are you here? Oh yeah. Peter, you yes. hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yes. I hear you fine. Um, thank you very much for this question. I think this is really kind of underscores the importance of, of why we need to be working on plastics. And I can tell you the FAO, the, the FAO in Rome is very much interested in coming up with standards to try and, and first of all, um, address the risk of environmental plastics in seafood, but then also come up with potential regulations for this as well. So. Um, if you send me an email, I will try and send you some information on this if you would like. And then in terms of the human aspects of it, there is lots of people trying to get into this. And, and from the medical um, field, I think if you go to you know, Google Scholar or, or look on the web, you will start seeing more papers on potential impacts of marine plastic particles, especially the smaller size marine plastic particles as potential um, Toxicants to to human um, physiological or metabolic functions. Excellent question, though. Thank you. Hey, thank you. That's uh, one of the important that the whole world had to look at. Thank you for your good uh, presentation, Elias. Open some uh, ideas on what are the danger to human, especially, and how to manage the environment. Um, any other question, Dr. Raina? I, I, uh, you didn't uh, discuss about the. A plastic in the uh, coral area or, or in the important uh, tourism activities in uh, in Sabah. Is there any record on that? Uh, okay, Prof. Um, in, in, in UMS, uh, we have conducted uh, some studies on the plastic pollution. It's very clear because our university, our institute is just next to the sea. Every day you can see plastic is all over the water, on the surface and below. The most serious is at the bottom, at the below, uh, at the bottom of the sea. So, uh, metro microplastic also, uh, we have our uh, researcher conducted uh, studies on that, and it's true that they have discovered that these uh, uh, plastic, uh, microplastic has a, a, a impact on our uh, beautiful uh, coral reef. But uh, most uh, very obvious is the plastic. Plastic covers all our uh, corals. And um, you know, what you see on top, on the surface of the ocean, is actually double or maybe triple the amount that we have at the bottom. So on the top, maybe we can use to, uh, what do you call it, any catch, uh, garbage catch, but how can we remove the one that's already settled at the bottom? This is very serious. Yeah. 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 Uh, Peter, do you have any uh, studies that can compare with what Prof. Raina mentioned uh, just now? Yeah, actually, um, we do. We have been working on corals in our laboratories where we are exposing them to, to different amounts of marine plastic particles, microplastic particles, and we use calcium 45 as a tracer to look at the incorporation of these plastic particles during normal calcification rates. And, and one of the papers that I had quickly flashed on the screen described that study. So if you are interested in more of this work, send me an email. I included the email in, in our chat and I would be happy to share the paper with you. Okay, thank you very much. Any other question from the participant? I didn't see any hands up. Uh, Peter, uh, from your study, uh, do you have anything or good technology? Because we know that uh, uh, 
plastic come from from land area from the human activities uh, sewage system and so on do you have this the technology or system that we can detect analyze quantify or filter it so there's lots of works going on on this and including i, I want to highlight again the work of new tech from this new iea initiative where on the upstream side Melissa Denike's work at NAPC is interested in potential solutions to the, the, the landward, the upstream side of, of mitigating plastic pollution before it actually comes into the environment. So that's one aspect. In terms of characterizing the amounts coming in, there are there's potential for satellite imagery that allows you to, to map and quantify and, and, and survey where the marine plastic pollution um is at is hot there are hot spots of that and then from that we can come up with you know strategies to try and um collect the plastic there are some very innovative things processes being developed especially in southeast asia where there for example are ships part of their 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 normal ferries are taking in microplastic in their normal routes mm -hmm. so there are there are we are, i think the attention has now um been so broad, so widespread that there are very um, innovative and, and new solutions being put forward and, and being tested. So I think we, as a collective um, community, we are really on the right track to try and come up with strategies that will make marine pollution, um, plastic pollution better as we go forward. Okay, thank you, uh, Peter. Very good, uh, very good uh, explanation. And that Professor Dr. Reina, uh i think uh, i mean yeah. i'm i'm working with wildlife so i'm very concerned about wildlife uh especially the marine life and marine life has been uh, uh discussed uh have a problem with uh, plastic pollution um can you can you tell us so we can share your, your knowledge especially in uh, our region uh, the uh, threat to wildlife in terms of uh, pollution uh, including plastic that we discuss or any other chemical uh, that we release from our sewage system. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, we understand when we pollute our ocean, uh, the water, we will stop many of these uh, many, uh, animals, um, the fish, the shrimp, everything cannot breed. They will stop breed, also we don't get enough food for the uh, fishermen, okay? So the sewage, especially um, in, 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 in our country, I'm sorry to say that it's never it's not been treated well, treated before it's been dis discharged. And this is what we are worried about a lot. Um, but I'm sorry, I don't have the, 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 the right, uh, what do you call that, uh, statistic or data on that. But it's been proved that some of the uh, sewage been uh, directly discharged into the water and uh, it's give harm to our fish, our uh, invertebrates uh, directly into, into our uh, uh, and about, uh, fish. But for bigger animals, like uh, maybe the mammals, uh, because they are moving, uh, they are, uh, uh, they are highly, uh, highly moved. So, but studies also show that they are also get affected by pollution, even plastic. I can share with you, we have experience where we have this stranded uh, uh, dolphin. No, it's a well, actually. And we have the chance to uh, do the post-mortem. Surprisingly, we found out that there are four, about four kilograms of plastic inside there. We tried to oh, yeah. save. Yeah, the one we tried is reported to in the media. Yes, Prof. It's yeah. so, so yeah. frustrated. It's so sad to see when we try to force feed, uh, we're trying to even drip the vet cam and try to sell these uh, wells. But unfortunately, when we do the post it's due to the plastic, plastics pack inside yeah. the inside the belly. So, okay, uh, yeah. I think we need, uh, we understand that, we learn about it, and we talk about uh, endocrine disruptor so that from the sewage, and then how the, the history uh, from the literature mentioned about the imposact and so on, and basically it's changed the, can change the population and the status of biodiversity in the coastal area at least. So now uh, I think very interesting talk by uh, Dr. Peter Sonsensky.
and then Dr. Sitorena, uh, 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 Omar Saleh, uh, very interesting. I enjoy it and then I learn a lot. Uh, now I think it's at the end of our discussion. Time is very short for us. The issues are very big to discuss. And then uh, we are now uh, come to the end of the second webinar series on the SDG 6 Water and Sanitation, co-organized by UNEP and Malaysia with uh, University Putra Malaysia. Uh, I hope everyone is uh, uh, has uh, gathered uh, some new information and we can have some uh, important thing to talk later and discuss uh, for the future uh, uh, environment. Today, uh, we covered uh, SDG 6 microplastic, one of the major sources of the ocean pollution by Peter, Dr. Uh, Dr. Peter Swazensky and uh, Professor Dr. Sitorena Mamasale shared a beautiful biodiversity in Sabah uh, Marine National Park uh, that uh, we are protecting. Uh, I'm pleased to remind everyone about the next upcoming webinar series number three on the 1st of April, 2021. Webinar number three will be focused on empowering coastal community by a member of Global Wastewater Initiative who will partner with a speaker from University Putra Malaysia who will present her proposal for empowering local farmers at the coastal areas. The next webinar will be moderated by our Professor uh, Raina from University Putra Malaysia who is a focal lead for the Implementation Working Group for the Global uh, Wastewater Initiative Unit. Until we meet at the next webinar series number three on the 1st of April 2021, we pray that everyone is safe and healthy. Love our environment for the prosper your community. Be safe and stay safe. Thank you very much from me and my smile. Bye bye. Hold on, we take a picture, please. All right. Okay, please switch on, on your camera, on your, your camera. Then we take uh, beautiful, handsome pictures. Okay, how about others? We have 57, 56 now. People are shy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no camera. Okay. Okay, you got it, Prof. Raina? Hold on, do you know? Where I asked the... Okay, what's Where yeah, I saw Professor Kozira on already, the camera. Okay. Thank you for joining, Professor Kozira. Okay. Right. Oh, Melissa, nice to see you. Yes, hello. Oh, Ricardo here. I thought yeah. I saw Bergie. <laughs> I can see Peter Swazinski. Yeah, Peter Swazinski. I can see Peter, some of the faces here want to go to Monaco. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, hold on. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. See you again in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.